Welcome back friends. So today we are tackling administrative law and our subtopics are as follows. So first is the, what is the meaning of administrative law? Uh, secondly, we're going to look at the sources of administrative law. We look at functions of administrative law. We look at separation of powers, delegated legislation, the control or methods in which you can control delegated legislation, the principle of natural justice, independence of the judiciary, supremacy of the constitution, checks and balances, and finish with remedies and administrative law. So fast forward, let us now look at what administrative law is. So administrative law is the, frame, the legal framework within which public administration is carried out. So we have a country where not everyone can do whatever he wants. The moment a government is formed, the first question that becomes is what are they going to do next? Even before they form the government, they're forming it on what basis? So this basis is a branch of constitutional law. And being a branch of constitutional law, is that it derives all its legitimacy from the constitution. So it is the constitution that tells administrative, tells us what administrative law is. So it is like the government is divided into administrative units and each administrative unit has a role that it plays in the country. There's another that makes laws. There's another that makes laws, but it, is, it has been delegated that function. There's another that decides cases. There are people who make government policy, people who form government. So all of them perform these functions under what we call administrative law. So administ administrative law is the collective term for the framework under which public administration is carried out. So administrative law is neither of civil or criminal nature, but it has a force of law within it. So what are we going to refer to? In what area of law are we going to call this administrative law? So it has been called to be of sui generis nature. And sui generis nature means that it is of its own nature. So sui generis is Latin to mean of its own, of its own nature. So they regulate and give authority to government bodies or government agencies like KRA, government bodies and commissions or this, these independent commissions regarding how to exercise their powers and how to make decisions. So they do not simply make decisions as they deem fit. There's a framework within which they make these decisions. And this framework is now what we refer to as administrative law, which is the collective term for that. So it's from constitutional law that administrative law derives legitimacy. So everything under administrative law is either from an established principle of constitutional law or has its basis in the constitution itself. So it's either written in the constitution or is a matter of practice that has gained notoriety in the constitutional space of the world. So constitutional petitions, are all based on administrative law. And in one constitutional petition, where Lamonde versus the chair electoral commission of Kenya, this was the Kivuitu commission, which last undertook the election, presidential election in 2007. So Ringera, being a judge, explained that in matters of judicial review, the court is neither exercising civil or criminal jurisdiction, but it is rather of sui generis nature. So this is where we are drawing this 
definition as of sui generis nature. So if you're asked to define administrative law, you can say it is a legal framework within which public administration is carried out based on constitutional law and being neither of civil or criminal nature, but having a force of law within it, within it and is therefore of sui generis nature. Now, let's go to sources of administrative law. And we've already seen one of the sources, Wellamondi versus ECK. So one of the sources is case law, but let us look at them in the hierarchy they fall under. So the sources number one is the constitution of Kenya 2010. So the constitution of Kenya 2010, in general, it has the rules and the principles that are applicable. And it further provides for further legislation to give effect to the provisions that it has. So where it is not, where the constitution is not an end in itself, where it doesn't provide the full remedy in itself or the full framework in itself, it is going to assign a duty to parliament to provide further legislation to give effect to provisions of the constitution. We're going to see some of this. Now, the specific articles will be Article 10, Article 22, 23, 27, 47, 49, 50, and 51. So these give us the national values. They give us the Bill of Rights. They give us the manner in which you approach a court to enforce you, your rights. It gives us the right to equal, equality and equal treatment and freedom from discrimination. They also give us the principles of fair administrative action act, that's article 47. It also gives us the rights of an arrested person. And it also gives us the principles that are supposed to apply or the rights that apply when you're giving somebody a, a hearing that is supposed to be fair, Article 50. Article 51, rights of detained persons. So these are very important when we're having this discussion on administrative law. And if you're ever going to forget any of this, just do not forget Article 47 of the Constitution. So Article 47 provides for the fair administrative action principles. So the first uh, other source of administrative law is the Fair Administrative Action Act, which is based on Article 47 of the Constitution. Then there's the Law Reform Act. There's case law. We have seen already one, one case, Wellamondi versus ECK. Common law is a source of administrative law. There is administrative practices in the sense that if an administrative unit has a specific modus operandi in the sense that it has a mode of operation that it has used for so long that it has become like a binding practice, then it is going to form part of what we call administrative law. There's also international law, academic writings, and policy documents, and other sources. The, the list is not necessarily exhaustive. So what are the functions of administrative law? So number one is that it ensures proper dispensation of services. People do not just decide what they're going to do. If you're going to court, there's a manner in which the court is supposed to deal with your case. So courts offer a service. They dispense a service, which is dispute resolution mainly. So administrative law prescribes how a court is supposed to handle your dispute. And therefore, the manner in which administrative law decides, has prescribed that the court is going to follow is what that court is supposed to follow. And therefore, 
it is the proper manner in which services are supposed to be dispensed in that area. It also protects citizens from abuse of power, protects them from malice and ill will. So abuse of power is one of the major problems that affect uh, most of the countries. It is even worse where the countries are developing countries. So it is, there is more need for enforcement of administrative law where the leaders of a nation are more prone to abuse of power. So it protects you from abuse of power, malice and ill will, so that people do not take decisions in the manner that they wish to take them. They need to make decisions in a manner that has been prescribed by the law and avoid doing or taking decisions in a manner that the law has said they shouldn't take that decision or action. So administrative law ensures some amount of certainty in the decisions that an administrative body is going to take. So if you're going to, let's say parliament, or a law is coming out of parliament. One thing with administrative law is that the principles falling under it, or the principles that have been prescribed by the constitution, specifically state the manner in which parliament is going to conduct its business. And therefore the outcome that comes from there is one that is predictable. You can guess, it's easy to guess what kind of decision is supposed to be, is going to be taken by, by, the, by the parliament. So if it's standing orders, there's a legitimate expectation that parliament is going to follow its standing orders. If it's the process by which a law becomes an act of parliament, a bill becomes an act of parliament rather, there's, an, there's some amount of certainty that it is going for first reading, it is going for the second reading, it is going through all those processes, it is going to the committee stage, the report stage, then it's going to the third reading and going for presidential assent. And there's a process for all that. So it creates an amount of certainty when administrative law exists or prescribes the manner in which things are supposed to be done. It also ensures and protects the rule of law. So the rule of law prescribes that everyone is equal before the law. It prescribes that the law applies to all irrespective of status. So it ensures and protects this in the sense that if you're going to behave as if you're above the law, then there are remedies that are provided for under administrative law that will ensure and protect the rule of law. Next, we're looking at the doctrine of separation of powers. So what is separation of powers? Separation of powers is basically the division of government responsibilities into distinct branches. So different branches, and each of these branches has a specific power that is independent of the powers that the others have. So that none of these functions is supposed to be in conflict with the other. So the aim of separation of powers is that people should never be in conflict with each other in terms of the kind of functions that they perform. So there would be a lot of mayhem, there'd be a lot of confusion if people started taking their cases to, to say the president for decision making. It would create a lot of confusion if courts started actively passing acts of parliament. It would create a lot of confusion, which is why separation of powers exists. Everyone should stay on his lane. When people, when all people lamp themselves on each other's lanes, then you're going to cause a lot of confusion and confusion causes accidents. 
So in Kenya, the function of each of these separate chapters is found in the constitution. So different chapters of the constitution. So the constitution provides for the functions, powers and duties of each of the government branches, of each of the commissions that are independent. So all of them have a function that they play and these functions should, should hardly overlap each other. Now, what you come to realize much later is that this separation of powers can never realistically be at 100% each. The reason being, once a court decides a dispute, it has no officers who are going to detain people they have convicted or sentenced. It has no officers to do that. So the moment they convict and sentence, the function goes back to the state because it is the state that has prisons. The judiciary does not have prisons. While some courts have cells, they do not have prisons per se. And courts do not bring people to themselves in order to pass judgment upon them. In criminal matters, it's a function of the state. It's a function of the Directorate of Criminal Investigations. It's a function of the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions to bring the people, to bring people suspected of having committed offenses to the court. So the court doesn't bring them to themselves. The court doesn't investigate them. So that at the end of the day, you realize that the, role, the court's role of adjudication has an input from the Directorate of Criminal Investigation in terms of investigation, has an input from the Director of Public Prosecutions in terms of prosecuting, then it takes its role of adjudicating and releases them again to prison authorities for imprisonment. And the law that they use is given to them by parliament. They do not pass the laws that they use. So, which is why most authors have argued that this separation of powers should rather be called fusion of powers. The same applies to other bodies. Most of the functions that they deliver or services that they deliver normally require the input of another body. So when parliament passes a law that is probably inconsistent with the constitution, then that law is supposed to go to the judiciary. Someone needs to file a petition. Once the petition is heard and determined, the court will have played a role in the functions of parliament. So at some point, these bodies have to coexist in a certain manner. And this is where the practice of constitutionalism comes in so that each of these bodies feels bound by the constitution when making the decisions that they do make. So what are the advantages of separation of powers? Number one is that it reduces the risk of power being concentrated in one person because that becomes dangerous. So one of the main advantages that is said of the constitution of Kenya 2010 is that it removed most of the powers from the side of the president. And the problem was then that the president could do things or actions that on the face of it looked unjust. The president enjoyed powers that on the face of it looked 
of, of very important nature of too much that, that the president appeared to be having too much power and took control of most of the bodies in the state. And therefore, separation of powers comes in to reduce the risk of power being concentrated in one person. As they say, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, which is why there is need to reduce the risk of power being concentrated in one person because of the danger that it poses. So it also helps in mutually reinforcing democracy. So in a democratic state, the will of the people is what is supposed to be followed. And now under separation of powers, the will of people is expressed through the different bodies. It is the will of people that is expressed to parliament. It is the will of the people that is expressed in the executive. It is the will of the people that is expressed through the judiciary. So it therefore helps in mutually reinforcing democracy. So in a case where democracy has been denied or the practice of democracy is in danger, you'll find parties rushing to court. You'll see that in a presidential petition. You'll see that in petitions for the election of a member of parliament, for example, a county governor. So had these powers all been in one body, then there wouldn't be a place to run to when democracy is under threat. It also allows different functions to be undertaken by persons most suited to perform them. So having said this, one thing you'll realize is that uh, in the judiciary, people, every person who is appointed therein, there's a minimum qualification that they need to have attained in terms of academic qualifications. Now, these people are most of the time the persons who are the most suited to perform these functions. So if you're the best person to perform the role of adjudication, you're going to perform this function of adjudication. I'm not sure about the other bodies in terms of the legislature and the executive, but the assumption that we move with is that since people elect these people, they have vetted them, they have seen them through their actions, and by the time they vote for them, they have decided that they are more, the most suited people to perform these functions. And it also allows bad decisions by other bodies of government to be checked by another body of government. So if a judge is guilty of gross misconduct, what is going to happen is that someone will file a petition with the Judicial Service Commission. When the Judicial Service Commission sits and makes a finding that this person, this judge may have been guilty of gross misconduct, they're going to hand this person over to the president and tell the president now forms form a body, form a tribunal to investigate their conduct leading to their removal. And if a bad decision is made there, there's a body, there's a, there's a provision for appeal. Now we have a question here. This question 3C uh, of November, 2015, we were told to describe the role of the three arms of government as envisaged in the doctrine of separation of powers. So we'll start with the legislature where its main role is to legislate, to pass, and amend existing laws. It's also supposed to oversight, uh, provide oversight over national revenue and its expenditure, to determine allocation of national revenue between the two levels of government, to exercise oversight against state organs, 
to approve an extension of state of emergency or declaration of war. So those are some of the functions that the legislature undertakes. Now going down now to the judiciary, its main role is to adjudicate. And what they can do is that if parliament fails in its role to provide oversight, a petition may be taken to the judiciary. So the role of parliament to legislate now becomes so different in the sense that the judiciary, all it's doing is to apply this law that has been passed by parliament. That is the main difference between the two. So the judiciary also have ceremonial functions. Ceremonial in the sense that they can participate in the swearing in of judges, the president, governors, etc. Then the executive, its main function is information of government, provision of security, implementation of government policy, and other functions. So they neither pass laws, except in limited instances, which we have, which we shall see in when we're looking at delegated legislation. And they do not make decisions, they do not adjudicate cases. Now, question 5b of May 2017 says we list three advantages of the doctrine of separation of powers. So we had discussed all this, that it reduces the risk of power being concentrated in one person, helps reinforce democracy, it allows functions to be developed, to be undertaken by people more suited to perform them, and it allows bad decisions to be checked by another body. Now, let's move to delegated legislation. And delegated legislation can also be referred to as subordinate, indirect or subsidiary legislation. This is legislation that is not passed directly by parliament. So parliament does primary legislation or direct legislation. On the other hand, delegated legislation goes now to other bodies. So for example, a cabinet secretary can pass regulations, say COVID regulations. And there's a period within which they're supposed to be taken for parliament for approval. We're going to see this. So these are passed by parliament, but indirectly. It is their role that has been given to that other body, their role to legislate is delegated to another body to do the legislation. These are all the laws, ordinances, rules, orders, regulations, proclamations that are made by statutory bodies or professional bodies. So matters engineering, engineers can make laws and send them for approval. So they are not like acts of parliament that are enacted directly. So they do not go through those stages of making a law. They don't have a bill that they are going to that they are going to pass the way parliament passes its acts. So what are the characteristics of delegated legislation? Is that one? They are all made under express authority of an act of parliament. So parliament has to give So parliament has to give its express authority through an act of parliament in order for a body to, to claim that it is exercising its powers and uh, delegated legislation. 
So they are rich end sources of law in Kenya. So subsidiary legislation are a rich end source of law in Kenya. So where you have written law, including acts of parliament, the subsidiary legislation is also just below acts of parliament as a written source of law in Kenya. And they must be consistent with the parent act. If you are supposed to legislate on dogs, you're not going to legislate on donkeys. If you're supposed to le legislate on oranges, you're not going to legislate on lemons. So it must be consistent with the act. The act is the one that gives them power. So if you act in a manner that is contrary to the act that gives you power, then that would mean that you are acting without any power at all. And they must be published in Kenya Gazette before coming into force. So that is another requirement of delegated legislation. So the question becomes, if you ask some of the characteristics of delegated legislation, then you shouldn't be getting this wrong. So what are the advantages of delegated legislation or why do we need delegated legislation? One is that it's speed, it can be passed in a speedy manner. So it's faster, for example, for the CS Health to issue COVID regulation during a time when they are needed immediately. So where you are told you're supposed to wear a mask. So you need to do that, that needs to come very quickly. The people need to start wearing masks. People need to start having social distancing. Matatus need to start carrying half their capacity or three quarter of their capacity. So this need to be passed a little faster. So you are not going to wait for parliament to sit in order to pass all these laws. There's an emergency that has to be dealt with. So as the speedy nature of these other bodies is going to be effective. Number two is flexibility. So it's easier and more flexible to pass a law without having to take it through all the stages that a bill has to take place in parliament. So it is more flexible to pass these laws. They do not, these other bodies that are going to pass these laws are not bound by the strict procedures of parliament. They do not have first reading, second reading or whatever it is. They do not require presidential assent. So they are relatively faster and they're more flexible. Technicality of the subject matter. So when we're looking at delegated legislation as a source of law, one thing that we said is that if we gave your mem area member of parliament and we told him now uh, help us legislate in matters medicine, engineering, aviation, technology, it is unlikely that they're going to be comfortable conducting these functions. And therefore, it is important to leave matters of the experts to the experts, matters of professionals to the professionals. It saves time for parliament. So the roles exercised by parliament are already too many. They are not going to make laws for each subsector or this every sector. So which is why these other bodies need to come and make laws, but they are subject to the approval of parliament. So the disadvantages of delegated legislation because it has disadvantages. So there's an argument that they are less democratic. Less democratic in the sense, <clears throat> when people elect their representatives to parliament, it is in their mind that they're the people who are going to pass laws. So the people who are now exercising their power under delegated legislation are not necessarily elected as members of parliament. And therefore, they're going to perform a function over people who have never elected them. So it's also difficult to control because there are numerous sectors and numerous subsectors, and there are volumes of delegated legislation that is passed on a daily basis. So when laws are being passed on a daily basis, it's very hard to keep up, even for parliament and courts, to monitor each and every law. 
the court cannot decide a petition on each and every law that was passed yesterday in the 24 hours that took place yesterday, or elapsed yesterday. Inadequate publicity. So there are so many pieces of delegated legislation out there, most of which the common people do not know. People do not read the Kenya Gazette. People are more likely to read a newspaper than to read the Kenya Gazette. So they suffer from inadequate publicity because most of them are not known to the common citizen. Then subdelegation and abuse of power. This is in the sense that at times the delegate is likely to delegate its functions to another party. Now, when a subdelegate, this subdelegate is not regulated by the law and is likely to abuse power. So the subdelegate is not recognized by law as someone who is going to pass these laws. So if they abuse power, it is highly likely that they are not going to be reached. While the delegate can be reached, the subdelegate who abuse power is hardly likely to be reached. So it can lead to abuse of power. And so the aspect of detail and technicality. So when these rules are made by professionals, they tend to use technical terms for that area. So they make it harder to comprehend uh, those kind of rules. So these technical terms are not known to the general public. And it, it can be argued that it goes against the doctrine of separation of power. For example, if the health CS is telling people not to wear masks, so he's saying this as, as a who, because it is not the role of the CS to pass the law. Uh, technically, when you're talking about separation of powers, this is supposed to be a function that is performed by parliament. So it can be argued that it goes against the doctrine of separation of power, but we do understand that they are also allowed by the law to pass some of these uh, rules and regulations. So now to controlling delegated legislation. So we already said it's hard to control. So in what methods can we attempt to control delegated legislation? The first is by way of a judicial review petition. So if a law is inconsistent with the parent act, it can be subject to a judicial review petition or a constitutional petition. If it is inconsistent with the constitution, the delegated legislation, it can be the subject of a judicial review petition. And at the end of the day, the court is going to say, these laws to this extent do not apply and therefore they cannot, the courts do not recognize them and they do not apply anywhere. And all decisions that are made by way of that delegated piece of legislation, then is not going to be having any force in law in Kenya. Also by way of constitutional petitions, there's a close relation between judicial review petitions and constitutional petitions. The difference arises from the kind of burden of proof and the threshold. So we can also control it by making the parent act having very specific provisions as to the nature and extent of the delegate's powers. So you do not, when, the, when making the parent act, it is advised that parliament is supposed to squeeze this power so much that the delegate is only going to be bound is going, going to legislate in a very narrow area so that they do, not, they do not leave a lot of room for people to merely act in good faith. They should be bound by specific, by the specific parent act, making it very difficult for them to abuse uh, these powers. And also make it a requirement that each piece of legislation gains parliamentary approval in order to gain the full force of the law. Now, Following this discussion, Section 11.1 of the Statutory Instruments Act and Section 11.4 of the Statutory Instruments Act. Do apply. So Section 11.1 and Section 11.4 of the Statutory Instruments Act are what are going to guide us over these areas. 
So it's section 11.1 says that the CS in charge of a regulation making entity shall within seven days of publication of a statutory instrument, ensure that a copy of the same is transmitted to the responsible clerk so that it's tabled in parliament. So within seven days of a publication in Kenya Gazette, the CS is supposed to send this to the clerk of the National Assembly or the Senate for it to gain approval from there from. So if, if it relates to matters of counties, then it is supposed to be tabled in the Senate or, or the National Assembly if it does not relate to matters of counties. Then subsection four says that the provision is going to cease to have effect on the last day when it needed to be tabled. So if it was gazetted on 10th and 17th has reached, so the seven days of, public, of publication have elapsed, then the law is going to cease to have effect by virtue of section 11.4 of the Statutory Instruments Act. And section 11 of the Statutory Instruments Act is a manner in which we can control delegated legislation. Now we're going to look at principles of natural justice. And natural justice is the kind of justice that, that is one is entitled to by virtue of being human. So it is not conferred onto you by any person, but they apply by simply by virtue of you being human. So these are the bare minimum that has to be achieved for anyone to conclude that the process has been fair. So without this, the court is supposed to overturn every decision that was made. And this includes even in matters of employment law. So there's the, so the first principle is a Nemo Judex rule to say that in full, that is a Nemo Judex in Cosa Sua. And what it says is that it is the rule against bias. So the rule against bias is that the authority giving a decision is supposed to have impartial people who are acting fairly and without prejudice or bias. This means that when you're making a decision, you should not have a conflict of interest in the matter. You should not be, you should not be a judge in your own court. So you should not be a judge in your own course. Now, this is a principle upon which parties will make an application for recusal to the court. The second principle of natural justice is ordeal term per term. So this means is that the judge is supposed to hear the other party or the anyone making a decision against you is supposed to give you an opportunity to be heard. So no person shall be judged without giving them an opportunity to challenge the evidence that has been brought against them. And they should also be given an opportunity to raise their defense, say what they have to say about the case from their own perspective. So you should never judge a person without giving them an opportunity to be heard. That is all day or rampa term, which means hear the other party. So the Nemo Judex rule and the old rampa term rule are the major principles of natural justice. We're going to see one other principle of natural justice. So Odeol Trampa term applies even where the adjudicator is very sure about the guilt of the accused person. So even if you were seen, even if they saw you, they should still accord you a chance to be heard. These are rules of natural justice. So the, no decision is going to be valid if the other party was not given an opportunity to respond to the allegations. So this is dominant in cases of employer employee where somebody has been fired. They need to be given a fair hearing prior to that. And these principles of natural justice normally play a big role in deciding employment matters. The third one is adequate notice. And this, while it, while it is important, is not as dominant as the other two. That is Odell Jarampa term and the Nemo Judex rule. Uh, it basically says that the person, the accused person or the person, a decision is going to be made against him or her 
is supposed to be given enough time to prepare their defense. They should be given notice of the kind of allegations that are being leveled against them. And they should be given time to prepare their defense if need be. They must be given a statement of the allegations that have been brought against them so they're able to, pray, to prepare their defense. So even in matters company law, if you, if you want to dismiss uh, a director from, uh, from his seat, they're given a chance to, to raise any submissions that they have in their defense. They must be given a notice of the evidence to be used against him in order to prepare to challenge the same during the hearing. Now, next we're having independence of the judiciary. So independence of the judiciary refers to the judiciary handling the business that arises before it in a manner that is in the following nature. Number one is supposed to be impartial on the basis of the facts provided. So they should not go against the facts provided in accordance to the law, free of restrictions, free of improper influences, free of inducement, free of threat, free of pressure or interference. Or, so this pressure can be either direct or indirect from any quarter or from any person. And then there's another aspect of independence of the judiciary, which is decisional independence. That a judge should never be faulted for making a decision in the manner in which they made it. As long as they are acting in good faith, they should never be faulted for having decided in the manner in which they decided. So no action should be taken against them for making a decision in, in the rightful manner unless they are in breach of a specific rule. There's also financial independence in the sense that whereas you can have the independence of making a decision, you'd also have independence in terms of your budget, in terms of your salary, so that if your salary is pegged on the decision of someone else, then it is going to be easy for this other person to influence even your decisional independence in return. In the sense that they can limit your budget to make you bow down to them. They can limit or limit your salary or reduce your salary to the extent that they want you to lose your decisional independence. Now, there are measures, and this is an important aspect that you normally gets tested. There are measures that are taken towards independence of uh, the judiciary. And this, uh, you'll see them in Article 160 of the Constitution. Is that the judiciary shall not be subject to control. So Article 160 says the judiciary is not going to be controlled by any personal authority that judges are given sufficient remuneration so that they are not easy, so that they are not easy or prone to getting uh, bribed or getting influenced financially by other parties. Judges enjoy security of tenure. So if you haven't reached the age of 70, your office still exists. That the salaries and benefits of judiciary staff are not, cannot be varied to their disadvantage during the time they're in office and even at the point when they retire. The judges are immune from liability in suits for acts done or omitted while discharging their duties. So you can never fault a judge for matters that they did in good faith when discharging their duties. Even if they get a decision wrong, they're not going to be faulted for that decision. Remuneration of judges is a charge on the consolidated fund. So what this means is that there is no way the consolidated fund can be expended in a manner that judges are not going to be paid in that say year or month, financial year or in that month. So always the consolidated fund has to pay judges. So it is a debt on the consolidated fund. Now, question 3B of November 
Question 3B of November 2015 asks, explain two ways in which independence of the judiciary is attained. And it's giving you four marks. I think these are three marks. You should be getting that very correct. Question 1C, September 2015, explain the doctrine of judicial independence. I think this is another three, six marks. Question 5A, November 2017, state four ways through which independence of the judiciary may be actualized. We have just discussed the, those here. Now over to supremacy of the constitution. Now under supremacy of the constitution, we're going to see that article two of the constitution reserves supremacy to the constitution. This means that it's not subject to challenge before any court or tribunal. And no one can claim to exercise state authority except on the strength of the constitution. He also refers to itself as the supreme law of Kenya and binds all organs, all state organs at the national and county levels. And it binds all persons. He also says that any law inconsistent with the constitution is said, so this includes even customary African customary law, is said to be a nullity. And court is likely to declare it as a nullity. Now, there is a US case that espoused this doctrine of supremacy of the Constitution. That is Marbury versus Madison. So, the case of Marbury versus Madison is what we call as a landmark case because it gave rise to the, to the duty or the right that courts can strike down laws that are not in tandem with the constitution and which is we call today as a judicial review. So it was the first time that the US Supreme Court declared an act passed by Congress as unconstitutional. So this is during times of uh, Thomas Jefferson's inauguration as a US president. And the Congress enacted 16 judgeships of uh, the Judiciary Act in the organic act that uh, that a fellow known as Adams proceeded to fail with federalists in order to preserve his party's control over the judiciary. So they were trying to overload the judiciary with federalists in order to preserve the control of this party in controlling the judiciary. Now what happened is that one, one, one of the people who was appointed to be a judge was uh, William Marbury. And he hadn't received his commission before Jefferson became the president. So he hadn't been given the formal appointment before Jefferson became a president. So once in office, Thomas Jefferson directed James Madison, who was giving, who was supposed to give to commission Marbury. So he told him to withhold the commission and therefore uh, Marbury went to court he sued for an order of uh, mandamus so that, Ma so that Madison should, could be compelled by the court to give the commission to, 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 to Marbury. So what the court held, the Supreme Court declared that the, it is because the constitution specifies that is the supreme law of land and that it's court's duty to uphold the law. So on one hand, the constitution says it's the supreme law of, of the land. On the other hand, so it is supreme over all other laws. And on the other hand, it is the court's duty to uphold the law. So the court said, it's the courts must declare all laws as a nullity if they're in conflict with the constitution. So this is where the court espoused the principle of uh, supremacy of the constitution and therefore gave the courts the duty or right to declare laws as inconsistent or a nullity if they were inconsistent with the constitution. So whereas the court decided as such, it couldn't grant uh, the remedy, it couldn't grant the remedy to, to Marbury because the act that he intended the act that Marbury was bringing the petition upon is section 13 of the Judiciary Act that gave the president more powers over judges 
and was therefore inconsistent with Article 3, Section 2 of the US Constitution. So since Mabere brought his claim and an act that was constitutional, the court declined to grant the same. It however concluded that Section 13 was unconstitutional, the Judiciary Act was unconstitutional, and that since the law is unconstitutional, they proceeded to declare it a nullity. So that is it about uh, supremacy of the Constitution. And it is on the basis of supremacy of the Constitution that all other laws below it are supposed to be in, uh, in tandem with the Constitution. Where they're not, the court has power to strike it down. Now we've got checks and balances. And in every democratic state, the principle of checks and balances has to operate. This is to mean each branch has power to prevent wrongful action of the other branches. Like parliament can check government spending. A vote of no confidence can be passed by parliament over the president's abuse of power, use or abuse of power. Uh, county members of the county assembly have power to impeach a member of the a, a, a county governor. The court has power to declare actions and laws is a nullity. Parliament is able to pass laws that can increase or decrease the power of courts. So if courts are looking as if they are overusing their powers, parliament has this power to check their powers. Parliament can amend provisions of the constitution, except to those pro protected clauses. Now, remedies in administrative law. Number one is mandamus. Now, mandamus is like a mandatory injunction. It is not a mandatory injunction, but it operates in the same way that a mandatory injunction applies. So this is to mean if the president is supposed to swear in judges who have been appointed by JSC, and he fails to take this action, and it is an action that he's supposed to do under the constitution, then the remedy of mandamus can be issued against the president so that he's going to be told, kindly go ahead and take this action that you are supposed to, to take. So it is not a request, it is usually an order that you're supposed to do this action that you're supposed to do. So it acts like a mandatory injunction where you're told specifically, go and do this. So you're told to do a duty that you should have done yourself even without being sued. Now, the next one, Next remedy is saturari. And saturari is an order quashing the decision that was made by a, an administrative body or any person, so to say. Now, saturari is to quash or to make an action as meaningless or having not happened. So where say a cabinet secretary makes a declaration that goes against the constitution, then it is going to be shut down, it's going to be canceled. It's going to, it's going to be declared as a nullity, as if it never existed. So this declaration is what is called saturari. So this saturari happens for things that have been done, but they have been done in a manner that is inconsistent with the constitution or in excess of the powers of the person who made that decision. So that decision is going to be quashed if it doesn't uh, go in tandem with the constitution. So that is what saturari is. So it's important to know that mandemas is for action someone is supposed to do that they haven't done. And saturari is for actions that have already been done that are now being quashed or being declared as nullity. There is prohibition. Prohibition is like an inhibition. It's like, it's like a negative injunction in the sense that you're being told, do not do this. Do not take this action. 
So this applies in matters where in matters where the person making the decision, someone looks like in, in, in terms of their action, they look like they're going to take a decision that is going to be unconstitutional. So they're being prohibited from taking such an action. Say they're about to refuse to give someone an opportunity to work in a certain body, then they can be prohibited from, from taking that action. Say people are about to pass a constitution whose the manner in which they have approached that process is not constitutional, then they're going to be stopped from taking that action. So that is what is called prohibition. Prohibition is, comes out of conjecture, suspicion, and you need to prove this suspicion. Why are you suspecting that they're going to do this? So you need to show evidence that this action is about to be, to be taken. There's an order in the nature of habeas corpus, and habeas corpus in law means uh, produce the body. So whether alive or dead. So if police have arrested you, and then they hold you in a unit that is not known, in a police station that is not known, or it's not a police station, it's just some other place. So court is going to make a note of habeas corpus and say, bring this person to this court. If you're charging him, just charge him, but bring him to court. Let us see him dead or alive, let us see the body. So this is an order in the nature of habeas corpus. The, the case of uh, Meguna Meguna, I think has been given all, all of these orders that are listed over here, including habeas corpus. At some point they had to present him to court. There's also an injunction, so court can give an injunction we have discussed injunctions before, that it is an order directed at someone to either do something or fail to do something. This is a declaration in the sense that court can declare that your rights were infringed. Court can issue a declaration that a law is not in tandem with the constitution and is therefore a nullity. So that is the effect of what a declaration is. And normally a declaration will be followed by some of these remedies or damages. So where court declares that your right was infringed, it is going to give either damages or it's going to give a mandamus, saturari or prohibition or a habeas corpus or an injunction. So that is it about uh, remedies in administrative law. And we have now come to the end of the class. Uh, thank you for listening in and uh, let's see you in the next class discussing the court system in Kenya. I have been your lecturer Derek Moma and uh, we hope to see you in uh, the next uh, class. So we have looked through administrative law, sources, functions, separation of power, delegated legislation, the control of delegated legislation, principles of natural justice, independence of the judiciary, supremacy of the constitution, checks and balances, and remedies under administrative law. So let us see you in the next class. So we are going, when we're going to look at uh, the court system in Kenya and their hierarchy. Thank you, I'll see you in the next class.